You found the number one internet site for irreverent, cool, and entertaining talk programming. It's LA Talk Radio. We say what we want. Now, broadcasting from the city of angels. You're listening to the Sheena Metal Experience with your host, Sheena Metal, only on LA Talk Radio. That's right, it's the Sheena Metal Experience right here on LA Talk Radio. For more info on the show, latalkradio.com, sheenametalexperience.com. Don't forget to email me and let me know what you think of the show and to call and talk to us live. 818 602 4929. That's 818-602-4929. All this hour on the Sheena Metal Experience. Returning to the show, one of my favorite actors and favorite guests. You know him for many projects, including his wonderful uh, long stint on Queer as Folk. Please welcome to the Sheena Metal Experience, the wonderful Scott Lowell. Scott, it's so great to have you here. It's wonderful to be back. Thank and you, you, you really are one of my favorite actors. I saw your the little reel that you had on Facebook that you had put together. Mm-hmm. And not only are you amazing from thing to thing, but so very different. Even oh, though you. sometimes you look the same from thing to thing, but yeah. energetically, when you're performing, you resonate very different from project to project. It's oh. almost hard to tell who you are. Do you find that, that sometimes people lose you? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I try to get lost as much as I can, and a lot of people tell me to get lost, and so <laughs> I, <laughs> I strive for that. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, it's interesting as, as I, I go along in this whole thing called a career, it's... Yeah, people kind of come up to you and approach you in different ways for different things and or just know they've seen you on something and they don't quite know what. And, uh, yeah, that's what I like. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a character actor, so that's... And proud and, of that. And very proud Some of that. Some actors are scared to wear that because they think that means I'm never going to have the lead. I'm never going to be the one that makes the money. But I think that as actors, don't we all become actors to play characters? Absolutely. I, I agree with you 100%. And I, I feel, you know, the leading man actors in a lot of ways get... You know, uh, I think that's kind of boring after a while, and they're, you're kind of d- doing the same thing time and time again, which is where you get someone like Johnny Depp, who, you know, should be a leading man actor, but he prefers to be a character actor. Right, and to disappear. To disappear, because there's more interesting things to do. There are more challenges uh, to be had, and hopefully more opportunities to be had as well, too. There's a lot more small character parts. And I, you know, and growing up, just watching all the old movies I watched, uh, I mean, that's who I was always drawn to. I loved watching all. The old Frank Capra films, especially because he just had this whole kind of stable of great character actors who you would pop up in film after film, and you'd go, "Oh, look, there's Uncle Billy. He's in this film too. He's in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington," and and uh, that was so exciting for me because you wouldn't recognize him at first, and then all of a sudden you realize, "Oh, that's the same guy who played right. the bad guy." And in I that do that film. now. Yeah, oh, I love that. Do you do and, that now when you watch oh, films? Like, okay, who is that? Absolutely, it's driving me crazy. And then you figure it out. You're like, "Oh, character actor," and you're so excited. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's that's always been my my joy to do that. Do you find, because I noticed when I watched it and I got to see so many of the characters put next to each other, including Ted from Queer as Folk, that, because in real life, for people that have never met Scott, um, and and I especially notice this when I see you out at events, you have kind of a, like a George Clooney thing almost happening. You look like George Clooney, and I'm sure people have told you that before. Um, So you have kind of like a leading man face, but when they put you into characters, it's almost like they they make you less attractive for the character. So, I mean, that's, I guess, a good problem to have in real life, attractive, and get to play the crazy characters. Well, well, thank you. I, yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny. I think part of it is kind of how you see yourself. And I mean, I, while, while I feel attractive, I certainly would put myself in the same camp with him, but uh, with Mr. Clooney. But uh, uh, yeah, I have heard that. And it's, it's, uh, from kind of the moment he was first on ER, I remember someone coming up with the TV guide when ER first went on the air, and they had you know the listing for ER first going on the air, and someone showed it to me and said, "Look, that's you." And I and I've never been able to see it. I just don't see right. myself that way. And um, and the characters I play, I, I don't see myself that way either. And I don't know. I think there's something that happens, especially on camera, that I, I don't come across that way. And I, I don't know. It's 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 probably something internal that I do to myself when I play these characters. That uh, they look a little different, um, but uh, yeah, I, I I I've always allied myself more with kind of the losers, and, right? Well, and, fun to play and though. The, yeah, and the more uh, and, and the more offset characters than and 
Yeah, so I, I don't know quite what, well, what happens. And you're lucky, I think, that you're you're a good enough actor that you can do that. I think that, you know, I have this running joke with a friend that every time she sees a movie, then she comes to me and says, you know, which one was Gary Oldman? She can never tell. Right, who, yeah. No matter how many movies she sees, she can never figure out who Gary Oldman is. <laughs> and I think it's that really good character actors almost, and if I'm getting too airy-fairy, stop me, but you almost energetically shape-shift a little bit so that you're... I, my eyes are seeing Scott Lowell, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. my but my brain is telling me it's the character because of the way that you can change your energy to be somebody else. Like the little nerdy guy that you played on Bones, that mm-hmm. I, they need to bring that back as a regular character because he was amazing, the footman. <laughs> um, you, I could see that it was you, mm-hmm. but... And I knew you were going to be in the episode. That's why I T-voted. So I was waiting for you. And still it took me a couple of minutes mm. to realize it was you. Mm-hmm. And even though I knew I was looking at you, it didn't feel like you. And mm. I think really good actors can... It's almost like a trick with... A, you know, like an emotional trick with mirrors where you're taking the attention off of yourself and putting it onto this character. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, you know I've... I heard that a few times from people you know will ask me you know I watched that whole episode I didn't see you not not bones necessarily but like um I did a, an NCIS back in the winter and had just one little scene in that and so I'm saying yeah I watched that whole episode I didn't see you I said well I was this guy that was you yeah uh, you know and you know it's again it's one of those I, I'm I'm grateful for that and I'm glad that things work that way because I watched the show and I go like oh there's my dumb nose you know I, just, I right <laughs> all exactly. I can see all I can see right. is me, is me. <laughs> right so um so I'm glad somehow you know so like you said some maybe some magic happens that uh, I shape shift and uh, and I'm not unaware of it and but. do you know I mean because I think that actors also when they're very good they they know you know how to do it but you don't really know why it happens that's very well put yeah I I don't know I mean you know you just kind of crawl into the skin and see what happens somehow and you try this and that and and it's why you know you can go out for you know 30 auditions for something and not get the part because it's not the right fit of the skin and something right. and then you crawl into one i mean and it's happened time again i mean i know when i'm going to get a part you know i like the the role in bones i went in and did it and it just fit right from from the audition and I could tell it did and I would have been surprised if I hadn't gotten that you know something some odd political maneuver must have happened if I wasn't going to get that part so right and uh, I've heard that's a great cast to work with oh they're everybody wonderful. says that's an amazing ensemble to be a part of they really are and I got to say I'm so impressed uh, with them and the NCIS group as well um, you know to be doing a essentially procedural show for right. that long a period of time and to be doing it so successfully i've been on a number of other sets where they're burnt out they're tired they kind of hate life you know poor things making, sure. making millions of dollars but yeah. um you know my heart is bleeding exactly right now. <laughs> right. but you know they have to say a lot of technical mumbo jumbo and is a different guest star every week and i could you know as i play devil's advocate i can see where that could get sure. to be a drag a bit but these people the, the whole cast of bones um uh, they are having a great time and they give it their all and, and same with NCIS they want to make every episode the best it's like someone hasn't told them you're the number one show you can coast <laughs> right <laughs> you know and that's what makes it such a good show I think so I mean, that's kind of proven to be true I mean the shows I've worked on that have been the most fun ended up being the most successful ones too and I think you know the shows a lot of other shows could learn from that right because um, it, it makes a difference and it comes from you know the producers on down um, Hart and Hanson the creator of Bones is a wonderful Canadian guy and you can tell his energy kind of infuses the set and then the leads of the show also have a job I mean it's you know it's part of your job I think to create the tone on a set and um, and I talked about that with Mark Carmen and NCIS actually that that makes all the difference and yes sometimes you're you're tired and you're cranking you don't feel like doing it but you have to realize that's part of your job welcome people to your set and make them feel creative so that right. they'll give you your best and right um and i and i don't get the opposite i i remember having a discussion with a friend once who had done a guest starring role on a show and literally as she was walking in the leads were leaving mm. and it was one of those things where you just you did your part with you know the script supervisor right and then they pasted it together at the end right and although i understand that it does get tiring and it is long days but if if i was a regular on a series 
and in addition to that was a producer. Right. Um, one, I would want to make sure that my guest stars worked with me so mm-hmm. that I would get the best out of my guest stars so the episodes would be the best they could be. Absolutely. And two, just would want to have the experience of working with all these new exciting people that are coming onto my set to be a part of my show that I'm also producing and supposedly I love. Uh, but I think some people just don't have that love for it. I, I think you're absolutely right and you should have your own show. Uh, I, well, I completely agree with you there. And I have four shows, but they're all on the radio. Exactly. But, you know, I could run, like, replays half the time no, here absolutely. and not be here all the time and yeah, look, take six weeks off and just put the best of on. And, and people would still like it. But to absolutely. me, it's important to provide the fresh show every day. And, you know, your show would not be as successful as it is were you not as excited to welcome someone into your yes. studio each time. If you yes. if you kind of sat and sat there and said, mm-hmm, and, you know, and you had a little piece of paper in front of you, so I see you're right. doing the... With the, the, with the, the, my assistant wrote the question. Exactly. And I was just like, so, uh. but that's you know your enthusiasm uh, f- infuses you know the whole show and right. makes you know you you make us feel more interesting than we really are. No, you are that interesting. <laughs> you know, I tell stories, and that's what yeah. I bring people in, and they tell their stories. And I facilitate them to make it interesting for people because not everybody who comes in here is great at radio. Right. You are very good at radio. Not every guest knows as much what they're doing. Some actors come in and there's no script and they don't know what to do. Right. And I have to get them talking. So it just, um, you know, that's my job. And I think somebody like Mark Harmon, who's really, you know, known for being one of those actors that if he's not going to put 120%, then he's not going to do it. Right. Exactly. And I think that also it trickles down from the leads. And I think the same thing with Emily that everybody said about Bone. Oh, yes. That she is a team player. She, she loves is. what she's doing. She's mm-hmm. a super nice person. Mm-hmm. And it's about her being excited about it. it. makes everyone else be excited about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. She's wonderful. And TJ and Michaela right. and Tamara, all of them. TJ's and a doll. A wonderful, wonderful guy. And, uh, and you know, and, and even uh, David Boreanaz, who he's, uh, I would say, just kind of quiet, you know, and and maybe having worked with actors myself, you know, on, on shows who are a little more quiet. Sure. Uh, I, I think he was great, and he was very kind to me, and he, you know, uh, likes to conserve his energy. So he's fortunate that he has Emily there, who's, uh, you know, a thousand-watt bulb, who kind of right. more than makes up for, uh, you know, talking to people and, and, and doing things. And he does an amazing job on the show. So, every, you know, even if there's something that might be perceived as a weakness, it's offset. And they, they've got each other back in, in a great way. And like I said, they, they want to make the show as as good as it can be. And that's, you know, after I think they're going to their seventh year next season. I mean, that's that's amazing. And it's a show that really, and I've watched <clears throat> it from the beginning, it's a show that gets better every year. Mm-hmm. It really is the cast, as they get more familiar with each other, they get even better. Whereas some shows get a little stale after the first couple yeah, of years and, yeah. and kind of die out. Now, there's there's really kind of two kinds of actors. And I think when you talked about Emily and, and David, that was a good example. Mm-hmm. Actors are either kind of quiet and mm-hmm. vary in their process mm-hmm. on a exactly. set. exactly, Or they're the kind of actor that's like, chat, 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 ha, ha, ha. Okay, and now I'm really in it right. as soon as the camera's on. Right. So where do you fall? What kind of an actor are you when you're in a situation, you know, in a play or, or film or television or whatever? Uh, I guess I would kind of fall in the middle a bit too. I mean, I'm, I can be pretty chatty, but I'm also really respectful of. Uh, I think I'm pretty uh, sensitive to what other people's needs are and what they need on a set and and what uh, how much quiet time or not quiet time they need and uh, and also in taking care of myself as well that I you know I know that I need to focus in on things and you know there's certainly been times you know back on Queer's Folk especially where uh, you know the scenes I were, was working on were difficult and emotional and and dark and you know I would I would you know say hello to the guest stars and I would talk to them and I'd say look I'm gonna have to check out for a while now and I apologize you know for not uh, being as, as uh, conversational as I might like, and and I and they appreciated that, so it doesn't seem like oh he's just a jerk who doesn't like me kind of thing. Right, and that's nice. Yes, let everybody know. Hey, I'm having a fun time. I love you all. Right, but I've got but some. But now work I to have do. to go in my trailer and think about being on Crystal Meth for 15 minutes <laughs> exactly. before they're ready for me. Yeah, this is going to be a tough. It's going to be a tough day. Like two different arcs, two or three different arcs mm-hmm. in that show in that period, six year period, that five year period that was really really intense and when I watch the scene that you have on your reel which is the scene where where um, you and Emmett Peter Page's character are he's kind of saying goodbye because oh, you're just right, right. you've left him for the lovely crystal meth <laughs> and that's a I mean that's an intense 
intense scene. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that the people that aren't actors realize how many times sometimes you have to do that again and again mm-hmm. to get the right take yeah. because they want the perfect light or they want your voice to squeak in the perfect way or they want to get the perfect shot of your eyes. Mm-hmm. And, and to be able to bring that kind of emotion again and again, uh, you, had a, you had a very emotional ride on that show. Yeah, I did. And, you know, again, maybe at the time I wouldn't have said it, but yeah, I'm so fortunate. I mean, it was like, what a, what a great gift to get to, uh, to do all those things. And that, that day, especially, I mean, I'll, I'll always remember. And, and I know Peter, uh, Peter Page would say the same thing. It was probably the hardest day we had in the whole series. Maybe the, the, the scenes we had to do in that whole day were some of the ugliest, worst scenes for Peter and I. And because we were such good friends too, it made it, it made it very difficult. And yeah, you have to do them over and over again. And, you know, fortunately it was, for the most part, just the two of us that day. So we knew what uh, each of us would need to get through that day and uh, could be there for each other. But, um, you know, but getting back to your original question, I, yeah, I mean, I, I like to keep a fun atmosphere on set and, uh, but not to overdo it. I, I also know when, to, like I said, I know when to be quiet and, you know, let the crew do their work. I mean, because there's a lot of people doing things and if you're, too crazy and i've been around that energy as well too it's hard for people to focus and it gets too loud and uh and you know so you have to be respectful but i i like to keep things fun (laughs) if i can you know yeah uh depending on the mood of the scene and Um, friendly and you meet you know every time you go on a new adventure like that yeah you meet new friends absolutely i mean you meet new people that are going to become part of your tribe yeah and that's you know that's why i say you know i i I feel okay, not not criticizing, but you you know uh, I, I feel somewhat expert in the world of a set at, at this stage in my career, and um, and I have little patience with um, people creating an ugly atmosphere on set because yeah, you know I agree. E- everybody's working hard, and um, you know you 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 need to boost people up to get the best out of them. I and, agree. Yeah, and I think it's harder to do now. Because now, if you are a diva on set, it's going to wind up on the internet. I mean, That's now true. people talk. They'll get right on their smartphone and eat a bagel with one hand and type, oh, guess who was just horrible to me in the dressing room with the other hand? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's kind of keeping the divas in check. I, I would hope so. I would hope so. But, you know, and then things can get out of, you know, like uh, that thing I remember a few years ago with um, Christian Bale on right. on his set. and. <clears throat> And again, I, I would never act that way. But look, who knows what that guy was going through that day and right. how difficult it was for him to focus on that set and something happened and, you know, whatever emotions he was trying to channel into his scene just blew. Who knows? I, I yeah. don't know. So it's also there's there's part of me that feels like, you know, uh, working on set is a bit like a therapy session and sure. what goes on there should stay there. Well, it also depends on what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're working on a set where... Uh, you know, it, there's it's an NCIS set, and it's all one of their one of the uh, one of their own has been kidnapped, and there's carnage. But you're playing like a clown at a kid's birthday party in right, a scene. Right. You don't kind of have to bring up all that dramatic interpretation. Exactly. You know, not everybody that's in an episode is doing the same dramatic work right. that other people are. Exactly, and that's that sensitivity I was talking about. That yeah. you, you need to understand where everybody's at and be sensitive to their needs. And, you know, and I've, you know, I've worked with actors who you I've had to kind of say, look, I get that your process is to talk nonstop and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and crack jokes and do this, but I, I need to focus a little. So if I'm not responding to you, it's not that I don't think you're great. I just need to do my thing so right you know <laughs> but uh to each of their own is there kind of a period when you walk onto a set because obviously they a television set obviously mm-hmm. they've worked together every week mm-hmm. and now you're coming in fresh mm-hmm. so do you kind of take a minute and sort of suss everybody out a little bit because you know they come every day and for them it's their workplace and they yeah. know oh god you know this one's going to be in this mood today this one doesn't like this this one's not good when stuff's going on at home but you're walking into a group of strangers and becoming part of the mix that week oh absolutely it's like it's the first day of kindergarten every time, you know, and you, you do, you have to feel it out, sense it out. What's nice is that you always get to start your day uh, in the makeup trailer and you can talk to the wonderful hair and makeup artists that they have there. And they're the people who are there every day. And they're the ones who in some ways spend more time with the actors, the regular actors yeah. on the show than anyone. And they're, they kind of become their therapist. So you can start talking to them and say, Hey, what's it, what's it like? How long you been yeah. on the show? Oh, and, great, they, okay. and they like to chit chat. They like to chit chat mm-hmm. and you can kind of start to get the feel for what the set is like and who the people are. And then, you know, and then honestly it's, you know, it's wait to see how you're greeted and, uh, and kind of go from there. And, you know, again, on, on the set of Bones and NCIS both, I mean, 
as soon as introductions were made, people had where are you from? How are you? You know, I mean, the yeah, in, the inquiries nice. were made, and 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 they just welcome you right in. And uh, and again, that puts me at ease and helped me feel better because it's hard. It's a very difficult job, and to to be a guest star, I mean, to be a regular it has its own uh, challenges, but to walk onto a strange set. Uh, saying these strange words and you know right. uh, with five or six people who spend every day together right. for seven years and who like you say have this chemistry yeah. and all that kind of stuff it'd and be like to- if you stepped on stage with a band that's been together for ten years exactly and somebody handed you the trombone and said okay now you're in the band for a week right and you kind of had to learn to gel with that rhythm and they're all used to playing with each other exactly and maybe you just learned to play the trombone last week for, for the audition <laughs> and right. that's it you right know. exactly um, because you know because the only time you've played this character before is the maybe one or maybe two scenes you did for the audition right you know a week or so before and you have to try to remember what did i do there and bring that in and now you have to infuse that into scenes you haven't done before and yeah so it's it can be very intimidating so to be put at ease in any way is just so helpful and smart for the cast to do um and uh yeah and they did it very well on both those shows having friends and and guests on the show that do a lot of guest star work is really over the last year or so really giving me a whole new respect for for guest stars and for the hard job that it really is to, yeah. to walk into a situation and and gel and then it would be like if you you went to a wedding and you had to become one of the family members for the wedding and right. then leave yeah you, yeah. Know, you really kind of are coming into a family yeah and having to gel in and like you said do a character that you haven't been doing for 10 years right do it and then leave and then the next week somebody else comes and does the exact same thing right and you know and you know and there's a different um uh, social strata on you know sets sure. when you're a guest star and you know and your leads are going to get and regulars are going to get taken care of first and their needs met first and uh, so I you know and it can go one of two ways also with the directors either they're you know they don't feel comfortable directing the regulars on the show so they're going to give you all their attention or it's the opposite where they want to impress the regulars on the show so they can get asked back and they're going to you know spend all their energies with them and you're just kind of left to flounder a bit and. Um, so it's yeah, it's it's you never know what you're going to get, which is terrifying and and wonderful all at the same time. And you know, and where you get lucky when, uh, you know, in Bones that I had so much to do that you've uh, you've got some time to work it out. When you have just one scene and you got to knock it out of the park and that's it. It's you know, that's it. You've yeah, you it. had a big part on Bones. I mean, you were kind of like. Um, you were kind of her nemesis for the yeah. for the entire episode. That was an interesting. I loved the character dynamic between the two characters, who were very similar, yet in a strange kind of competition with each other. Yeah, even I, though she thinks she's not in competition with anyone, exactly. but still, she gets a little jealous. Yeah, I, I, I felt that as well, and uh, and and that's why Emily was so much fun to work with too. And you know, and I had watched uh, some episodes of the show before I started and really saw, you know, what she was bringing to her character. And I kind of felt there was a similar, you know, almost Asperger's like quality. There is. uh, And isn't that funny on the fan forums, right? It's all about, have you gone any of the bones fan forums? It's all about, does she have Asperger's? There's all these threads about it. And people are really like psychiatrist fans are weighing in. I think it's hysterical. Yeah. I I mean, I, I, I kind of felt that was going on right away. And I thought, uh, that my character uh, Dr. Fillmore had a little bit of the same too yes. and uh, and and discussed that with the director and he, he kind of agreed and so he would kind of come over and it's like alright a little less of the Asperger's or a little more of the Asperger's here <laughs> um, he was really it was wonderful Asperger's challenge it was a little bit of Asperger's yeah. challenge so yeah so we had some great little Asperger duels I think <laughs> and you yeah. know saying or, or you know inappropriate things to each other or masking them and I think just you know his you know the Canadian side of him kind of masks his Asperger's a little bit more, I think, because he doesn't want to. Right, people think anybody. Asperger's are just Canadian, right? They're not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a new game show: yes, Asperger's exactly. or Canadian. It's a new internet challenge that people do, and you uh, at the end you might win a free iPad. Right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's that's so true. Uh, but that's interesting. Does it help when you're going to do a guest spot? To, to go back and, and read through, I mean, watch some of the episodes as you're reading through your script and kind of get a gist for the characters played out live oh, as ab- opposed to just looking at the script. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's necessary. And I, you know, I try to keep up with most shows that are out there to watch at least an episode or so just because they all have different tones right. and moods and things like that. And uh, it's definitely helpful. Like once, is, I mean, for the auditions, I'll do it too to watch, you know, because it's hard to tell from a script. Sometimes is this supposed to be sarcastic? Is this, right. you know, is this in earnest? Um, and uh, but then once once I know I have the job, especially to kind of see, so you kind of know what your parameters are too, and what kind of energies. I mean, the, the character was 
probably a little, you know, in, the character I did in Bones was probably a little bigger than, in some ways, than I might have done if he were on another show. I might right. have, you know, I, there was a, you know, a slightly larger than life quality to him um, that I felt was appropriate for that show because right. that show has a certain, it doesn't take itself too seriously. It almost puts a little <laughs> camp slight bit into the scientists yeah so that you see how very intellectual they are yeah but also their their <laughs> idiosyncratic natures are all brought out right. and that makes them i think more fun for regular people whereas i think if it was all done very in earnest like you said unless you were really into science right you might not really get the characters that much i agree i agree and you know that's you know wonderful about you know uh the work I think TJ, for example, has done on the show is again over time. I think he's found a way to like really ground all that in his character. Yeah. That you know, uh, I wish I had had more time with mine to kind of find a little bit more of that. But uh, uh, yeah, he, he's wonderful at that. And uh, he's just a Michaela. fantastic actor. Though. He is. They both are. She is as well. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and John Francis Dale. I mean, really. I mean, just what a wonderful group of people. You know, that happens to all be on one television show. Yeah, they're very lucky, and that does make a difference. I mean, whether we want yeah. to admit it or not, uh, there is a synergy with actors, and Absolutely. when you get the right kind of synergy of energies together, yeah, it does make a difference in in a long time show where you're going to watch the same people over and over and over again. Absolutely, and I think that's why things like Law and Order have been so successful for twenty years. Is that you know when you have a group of of regular actors that are wonderful together, mm -hmm. even if they swap out now and then because twenty years is a long time, uh, then anybody can come into the mix as the guest stars every week the judges and the suspects and the victims and it's okay because you know you're going to want to watch these people even if you don't particularly like that particular storyline right you're going to keep watching it because yeah. you like the energy of the actors together that's that's very true and i think it's it's probably also why you uh in some cases you find actors on long-running shows like that who kind of are their characters in some ways because it's easier you know for the casting director and the producers to just hire someone who is that person and they sure. know they can rely on that and uh you know and it's something i've i've run into with uh casting directors i met who you know when i was first coming off of queer as folk who just assumed i was right that Ted. character because that's what they're used to <laughs> right very gay and very geeky yeah and you porn know yeah and crystal and, meth yeah and 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 overly sarcastic and and you know and, right. and so many other things so it's uh yeah it's it's it really is one of those lightning in a bottle kind of things and to you know get a group of people together and we were very fortunate with that on careers folk too and you know and uh, yeah, great that, energy, all of you together. All, really, when I had you all in the same place, yeah. I could really feel. When we blew up your studio. I loved it. How amazing. <laughs> if I was going to take a vacation, that's one of the shows I would throw on. Uh, how amazing all of your energy is. And now that I know so many of you in real life, it it's no different. I mm -hmm. mean, it really, the synergy with you guys is really amazing. And even like when people post, like someone just posted something on Facebook and it was Taya and Gail at, at his Young Playwrights Festival, uh -huh. which we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Yep. And um, there's just, it just feels good when you guys are together, whether you're on screen or off. It feels good for us too. We actually just had, um, because uh, Randy Harrison was in town for the weekend and he just left today. And so I had a, a barbecue at my house last night for everyone before he got out of town. And so uh, most of us were together at the house last night and you know we just had an amazing time and and you know i've heard from a bunch of them today saying it, it, it's some it was healing in a way for us because we we don't see each other as much as we would like to but right. when we do come together it's it's still this magical thing and we uh just love and adore each other so much and i think that bled through in the show you know and if it didn't have that energy i don't know if it would have worked as well yeah and you're, you know <clears throat> your fans who you know email me every day somebody does <laughs> well you are you are radio qaf oh you've my. become yeah i have i write i sort of feel like i'm you know like the eighth queerest folk member like the fifth beetle um you know there there is a love for all of you and not just for your characters it's not just wacky fans that that oh you know, i think these people are really their characters no. they have all taken time to got to got and gotten to know each of you as actors yeah. and each of your personalities and and it's lucky for them that you're very active on Facebook and mm -hmm. and uh, Michelle's very active on Facebook and mm -hmm. Twitter Michelle Clooney mm -hmm. Taya is now on Facebook mm -hmm. so that you are and Robert's on Facebook yep, Robert Gantz Peter and, and Peter's on very good on Facebook always yep, has been Peter yep. Page um, and so, Hal, Hal Sparks was I think ahead of the curve I think he was uh, he may have invented Facebook well I he think. was very active on MySpace and my, even that's right. before Facebook See? and he's very active on Twitter it's very very active. so it's it's nice that that you're all out there and so that they're they're able to get to know you as actors mm -hmm. and to get to enjoy other things that you're doing and have the same love for you 
that carries over as they loved you on Queer as Folk. Whereas sometimes I think fans, uh, they either pick one person out from a cast and, and they really like that person. Or, and they want to know everything about their lives. Or they're really obsessed with all the characters. Mm. But if you're doing something, if you ran for president, they'd be like, yeah, but it's not queer as folk. We're only interested right. in Ted. Right. <laughs> and, and you guys have been very fortunate that your fans are some of the best fans in the world, I think. I've been in this business my whole life. And I think some of the best fans I've ever dealt with. And very interested and supportive of everything each one of you is doing as yeah. an actor and as a person. And and oddly protective in a lot of ways Very. too. I mean, it's it's really wonderful and and uh, as you say, I mean, so supportive of the continuing work. You know, as much as I think you know, I hear on a daily basis we we want you all to get back together and sure. you know, do a new, new show together sure. or everybody a, wants a that. reunion, That's all normal. that kind of stuff. But isn't that but great that this many years wonderful. later oh, it's, they it's, love you so much? It's amazing, but they also are as excited about you know whatever new things we're doing as yes. well, and that's and that's tremendous. And I I should also mention I was speaking of Facebook and Twitter, I was twittered that uh, by some of our, our wonderful European uh, fans that I'm supposed to speak slower on your show because sometimes I'm hard to understand. Oh, okay. In a foreign tongue. Uh, so. But did you see that when you guys were all here with me in January that a couple of girls, I think, from Spain made uh -huh. a transcript. Oh, I didn't see they that. They did a complete transcript of the entire show, wow. including Sheena Laughs or Gail <laughs> Pauses because for people that don't speak English, yeah. they can take the transcript and go to like Google Translation and have it put in any language they want. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, that's that's so interesting. That's amazing. Fans are a beautiful thing. And, and I will get thank yous today because I have you on and the next hour I've got Taya yes. on. I will get th thank you so much for supporting Scott and Taya. <laughs> I mean, very earnestly. Yeah. And I I think no. that's lovely. I think it's great too, and it's you know, it, and it's been wonderful again to see the growth throughout the world of the show. You know, we we kind of right. had you know the success here in the states and in Canada early on, and and it's everywhere now. And we're you know we're working with a, a woman in Germany right now and hoping to put together the first uh, entire cast queer as folk convention Fantastic. in Cologne next year, and hopefully get like all you know everyone from across Europe. Hopefully, would be able to come to Cologne and come to this convention we'll see if it you know if it if it happens or not but uh you know we've all talked about it as uh, an in, uh, everyone in the cast and everyone's excited about th the prospect of that you know for us to all be in someplace together and also to see you know uh the european fans especially we haven't really met too many of them and uh but their enthusiasm has been overwhelming and and so strong so it's uh it's wonderful and you must think as an actor well i did i did something right because these amazing people still are following everything I do. I do. You know, I had, it was a few years ago, I, I, I got into, uh, I will confess, a kind of a bitter place of feeling like, you know, I had done this show, I'm a big star, where's all my, where's all the work, you know, why, have, why is not work <laughs> flooding in my, why are people not sure. banging down my door to give me other projects and other films, and I had spent some, a few months in New York, and everywhere I went in New York City, didn't matter where I was, someone would recognize me, and oh, I love the show, and I kept thinking, yeah, great, how about hiring me, because um, I wasn't working as much as I wanted to, and I uh, had some other law in my life that year and I went off to the island of Molokai in Hawaii beautiful I, I and not Hawaii. by force because you had leprosy no exactly of your own volition exactly my own volition I went and I did go to the leper colony there yeah and uh, got recognized <laughs> <laughs> by lepers by, uh, the, uh, the, no by, oh. by, by visiting people to the leper colony but still I got back to the place I was staying and I thought right here I am on one of the most remote places yeah. I mean that leper colony is so remote I mean you, I had to yeah. you know ride that donkey trail down to get to it uh, in one of the most remote places on the planet and I had someone come up to me and thank me for doing that television show and it uh, like a knot untied inside of me and I realized look I may get if I get nothing else out of having done Queer as Folk I did it and and, right. and it meant a lot to people and you know I'm not owed anything else other than that and it's kind of freed me from a lot of that stuff which I you know I've seen happen to a lot of other people who you know reach a level of success and, and feel they deserve more after that it's like I, I don't deserve anything else other than the thank yous you know and right. I don't even deserve those but I, I am appreciative of those and, 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 and grateful some actors for them. never get one of those right exactly. that makes them famous forever exactly I see a lot of that with friends of mine that were child actors in the 70s that oh, you bet. know that we all went through that phase where I don't want to talk about being on this and now I've come to this place where they're like look it's been 40 years and people are still watching the DVDs of this show right. every day showing their kids showing their grandkids 
I need to kind of own this right. and be prideful of the fact that whether I was six when I did this or 16, I did some good work. Absolutely. And people still love me and kind of come to peace with that. And I went through that, you know, just a tiny bit all the years I spent on the Howard Stern station. Sure, sure. That for a long time it was, weren't you on the Howard Stern station or are you still on that Howard Stern station? station's not even there anymore. Howard's not even there anymore. Right. But still, that's what people will always associate me with that. Right. And there was a time where I kind of had to make peace with it and think, you know what, maybe that's the most famous I was ever going to be and just be happy that I had that because some people never get that and it was not even two days later I got offered this show so sometimes I think you have to kind of surrender I think you're right and then once you do then you kind of open the way for more things to come I think you're right but while you're still kind of holding on to that and it's hard when Mm -hmm. everywhere you go all you have to stay is you know I'm Sheena from the Howard Stern station oh do you want this table right and then suddenly the phone just stops ringing because it's over yeah and I think we all go through that and then you have to realize that part of this business is it goes up it comes down goes up and it's always going to do that it's always going to be highs and lows i think you're right and and you're absolutely right and and you have to let that go because you walk into a room you walk into any relationship with that energy and you're just keeping yourself from letting in new things i think because you're still stuck in the past and in an odd way never mind the people coming up to you saying weren't you on the howard stern station right being stuck in the past Uh, you're stuck in the past because of how you're reacting to it rather than yeah as you say how wonderful yeah i was wasn't that cool yeah i got to do that yeah, and even I think it took me a long time, and maybe you too, to just kind of come to peace with the fact that nothing lasts forever right. in this business. Right. You know, that if you have two years on a series, great. If you have five, fantastic. If you have ten, you're one of the luckiest actors in the world. Absolutely. But there's always going to be a time when it ends, and then something else starts. Yep. And uh, some people are great with that. They can get very attached to something, then get unattached, then get reattached. I tend to attach and stay attached. Sure. So it's, it was harder for me to realize that it was always going to be coming and going. And but you that's okay. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And to realize, you know, you're not alone in that. I mean, I, I also had the thought process of, well, think of all the shows I loved growing up, you know, uh, Hill Street Blues. Sure. You know, so many one, which was a great ensemble show. And how many, you know, people from that show do I see on a regular basis working now? Right. You know, and right. those were the, those, uh, some of the best actors I've ever seen. They're all the guest stars on Law and Order. Right. That's exactly. where you see them. My yeah. mom's addicted to Law and Order. And it's like a cavalcade of the 70s and the 80s. Exactly. Every person who had a hit movie in the 70s or the 80s or a hit TV show is now a judge or a defense attorney or, or a criminal on Law and Order. I heard that about the new x-men movie too that it's a parade of all <laughs> is uh, it uh, suppose i haven't seen it yet but supposedly there's like a lot of old, oh that guy like that you remember from old shows or old movies or, i kind of love it just oh, for that now sure it goes back to our weird character actor thing. <laughs> exactly it's the sheena metal experience <laughs> la talk radio quick break and we're right back with more of the fantastic scott lowell it's the sheena metal experience right here on la talk radio for more info on the show la talk radio.com sheena metal experience.com don't forget to email me and let me know what you think of the show the wonderful scott lowell is on the show with me uh all this hour and it's so fun to have Scott here because as I said you know Scott I think I don't know if it's just that you're such an amazing guest or that I feel comfortable with you enough because you've been on the show a bunch of times that you let me kind of pick your brain about Mm -hmm. your experience as an actor and you have a very candid open honest way of describing what it's like to be an actor in different situations and I think that that you know people don't know about things like that it's therapy for me Oh, good. It's free therapy. I like that. <laughs> so is your love, because I know we talked about this when you were on the show the very first time, mm-hmm. above all else, is live theater still your love? Yeah, I would say so. Mine too. I Absolutely. get that. Absolutely. You know, it's it's just something so different and unique. And, you know, the, the things you do on a television or film set are their own challenges and right. their own joys in a lot of ways. But, yeah, that thing of, of have performing for an audience that's right there and feeling that energy coming from them, it's, you, you can't duplicate that. And it kind of you know separates the men from the boys as it were as well i think it really um it pushes you in in extreme ways and you know whether you're doing a short run thing like you know the the young playwrights festival coming up or you're doing a long run of a show they you know they each have their challenges of how do you do this on a nightly basis keep it fresh uh, keep exploring things um and keep it honest you know is is always a challenge so this is the second year that you've done the Young Playwrights Festival? Yes, I, I was lucky enough to do it last year. I did a, a wonderful play that was written, I think, that, and Buñuel and Un Chien wow. Andalou and like all this strange surrealist imagery going on in it in this, wow. in this tale of a guy who's maybe killed his wife, maybe hasn't. Um, uh, and it was wonderful and truly, and I, I think I told you it was one of the more challenging things I've worked on in years and it was written by a teenager. <laughs> and, and so when uh, I was approached by... Uh, uh, Erica Silverman, who was uh, working on the casting for it with Scott David and April Webster, they they contact me. Are you free again this year? I said I'll 
uh, yes, <laughs> and yeah. uh, and got to work again with Daniel Henning, who directed me last year as well, and he's directing this piece uh, that I'm doing this year, and this one is written by a, a 17-year-old uh, named Kathy Meyer, who uh, uh, lives out here, or Mayor, rather, and um, lives out in, in Los Angeles, and uh, it's a lovely, sweet little tale as well, and, and uh, you know, I went to, I think, three weekends of the show, of the of the festival last year, I didn't, I missed one week, I think, and I think I'm going to have to... I might have to miss one week this year as well, but seeing the scope of the work that these these young people do, it's just it's just amazing. Like we, I think we were talking earlier about, you know, there is some kind of old souls in them that I, I don't know. I, and I guess I just get envious of that. I wish I was that wise when I was their age because some of the things they write are so funny and moving uh, and wonderful that it's it's great to get to go and explore them as an actor, even for just a couple weeks. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be back again, and, um, and we have a, a great cast in my show as well, Jerry O'Connell, who uh, wonderful. was a wonderful guy, terrific actor, and I, you know, lucky to have worked with him in The Defenders last year on his, uh, on his series, and, uh, and we're together again. He's playing my master. I'm, a do- I'm his dog, and he's my Beautiful. master. Yes, thank you. And uh, so if, if you've ever wanted to see me crawl around on all fours, this is Loving your it. opportunity. And we thought last year's <laughs> was full of surrealism. <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, Marsha Wallace is in our cast She's wonderful. This year, I just directed amazing. her in the vagina model. Oh, did you? And she was hysterical. She's going to be. She's brilliant and she such really a nice is. lady. Oh, I, I'm just. I'm, I can't wait to come see your show. It, it'll be fun. And uh, so, yeah, that's going to be going on. Our, our show, uh, they've already been through one weekend of the show, and, and Gail Harold was in. Uh, one of the plays this past weekend, and Taya Gill, who you're talking with sure. next, uh, I'm, I'm her warm-up band. Um, sh- her show is going to be part of uh, the second weekend, which is right. coming up this, this week. Weekend. Mm-hmm. And then my show will be part of uh, week three, the 16th through the 19th of June, uh, Thursday through Sunday. Sunday's a matinee, although they may add an evening show from what I hear. Um, so uh, it's wonderful. It's it's a terrific thing, and they've been doing it for 19 years now. Wow, which is amazing. Uh, you know, as long as the blank has been around since Noah Wiley and and Daniel Henning started this theater company, I think the theater company's maybe been around 20 or 21 years. So from very early on, they've made this a priority of theirs. Longer than most of the playwrights <clears throat> have been alive. Exactly, that's interesting. Very much so. And you know, and Daniel talks qu- quite a lot. And uh, I think Taya might be bringing uh, Warren Davis, who's an old friend from Chicago, and he's worked on the festival for a, a lot of time. Uh, uh, Many years, uh, he may be able to fill you in more on this. But uh, you know, many of the writers who have worked uh, had their plays first done in the Playwrights Festival and had their very first works done in the Playwrights Festival have gone on to careers as television writers or uh, you know, oh, I can per- professional playwrights, things like that. Because it's been going on so long, they've been able to see now the fruits of uh, of their labors here, and it's That's it's been wonderful. just so moving for them. You can see every year they're just so passionate about it. So, yeah, I'm I'm happy to be doing it again, and I encourage everyone to come on out to the uh, the Stella Adler Theater. And I'm so Hollywood. impressed with everything that the Blank is doing. They do terrific work. They do wonderful, wonderful. challenging plays. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think I told you I was telling you before the show started today that I saw uh, Jim Perrick and Mike Farrell in Terre Haute mm. in the fall, and it was you know just the two of them. Right. Very serious show. And that was dealing with Timothy McVeigh. Yeah, it was based on the fact that the Gore Vidal and Timothy McVeigh became pen pals. Right. So it was loosely based on on that without right. using their real names, and uh, basically Jim was behind in solitary confinement the entire play. Wow. And Mike is on the outside. It wow. basically takes place in a visitor booth mm. at a prison. And uh, I've never seen, and I, I thought Mike was an, um, both of them were amazing actors, but I've never seen anything like, like Mike Farrell was in that. Oh, I mean, wonderful. I mean, I always, and I started saying really after I saw that, that if you love someone on a TV show or in a film, see them do live theater mm. and you'll realize what an actor they really are. Because mm-hmm. it, it's very different when somebody is right in your face acting their ass off. Absolutely. It's a whole different thing. Yep, yep, you're right. It's a whole different level of intensity. So did you go see Gail's show? Uh, I did go see Gail's show uh, on Friday night. Uh, a few of us from uh, from Curse Folk uh, went and uh, supported him, and it was great. And and again, the, you know, all three plays that night were wonderful. Some were very very funny, some shocking and moving. And uh, and Gail's play again was like a mini uh, Angels in America, practically. <laughs> you know, it it took place in the '60s in Russia and dealt with the space program there, and then you know moved forward in time to 2012 and. Uh, and was wonderful, you know, and uh, and and he was great, and I think, and I know he had a, a lot of fun, and, and you know, I spoke to Taya yesterday, and I know she's having a great time uh, with her show. It's 
you know, they're like little palate cleansers in some ways getting getting to do them. because Are they full-length shows? No, they're, I mean, because they do three shows uh, a night. So there's oh, wow. a, a okay. two, usually two shows in the first act and then one, a longer piece for the, the second act. So um, they vary in length from 15 minutes to half hour, 45 minutes. But... Um, I'm so they're not an enormous amount of line memorization, considering you only have just a few days to. No, exactly, which is where it's it's great and, and not too intimidating because you, you know you do get some actors uh, who maybe this is their first time doing theater, and so that's wonderful too that they have that opportunity to you know they're used to doing film or TV and they want to dip their toe in the theater of water and they maybe don't come from that world and so they get to come and work on something for a couple of weeks and maybe it's only fifteen or twenty pages long. It'll still have its acting challenges to it, but they don't have to worry so much about. Uh, you know, doing a full length play for their first time doing theater, and right. uh, and so it's yeah, it's it's a terrific program and a, and a really wonderful festival. Well, I also <clears> think <throat> that as our attention span as human beings is changing, mm-hmm. and as we're seeing more things on YouTube or you know something short on Twitter or something that somebody emails you that's condensed. Yes, we're not necessarily everything doesn't need to be two and a half hours anymore. No. Uh, you know, I think we're learning that really good pieces of art can be short. Yes, and I think it's a lot of why people are enjoying so much television now mm-hmm. is that it's people have about you know I've got about 45 minutes in me right and then next week I want to see another 45 minutes and follow the story which is kind of how you know with serials what Absolutely. film audiences were like when films started they were short and to the point point. and it's where things like you know I mean Charles Dickens one of my favorite yes, writers yes me too you know, he's one of my I, favorites I too I love reading his stuff but you know, all his stuff started as serialized pieces in magazines yeah. where you would get a chapter each week and, and that's all you had to commit to. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you couldn't wait till the next chapter came along. And, and it's interesting. And that's happening now with, uh, you know, all the television programs coming out on DVD because now you have the opportunity to, you know, whereas, you know, in the past you would have to wait a week for the next episode. If you're watching something on DVD and even though it's midnight and you really should go to bed because right, you have to work the next episodes. day. But there's four more episodes. I'll just plow on and through. And if I finish them, <laughs> then I can send it back to Netflix exactly. and get the next disc. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's so true. How many times have you sat up and made yourself oh, finish watching? I did that with The Wire over the past few months. I, went, right. I plowed through all five seasons of The Wire probably in about two weeks, I think. <laughs> I just right. couldn't, I couldn't stop. Um, but, um, uh, but it's it's still it's in your control and you're right I think you know uh, serialized television is kind of becoming the new films and it's why so many film stars are going into TV now I think because they yeah. realize they can still have the worldwide appeal that they have from being in a film and they can have a slightly more stable lifestyle and uh, live in LA live and in actually LA. get to be home and pet their dog and see Absolutely. their kids and, and that some of the quality of the storytelling going on when you have 13 hours to tell a story rather than just two right. you can, times however many years yeah you can spend you can spend a lot more time with this character and 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 ferreting things out as it were yeah um and that's you know that's wonderful yeah, yeah. i agree i wonder if a lot of people go to the young playwrights festival and see everything I just think so. Stay and yeah, see all three shows. I, I don't know. I mean, I know they stay. I mean, they'll stay to see all three shows for that. You know, for the night they come. Right. But they also they sell festival passes as well. And if you go to the blank dot com, I think is their website. Um, they sell festival passes, which will get you tickets to all four weekends of the show. So the first weekend's already passed. So don't get that now. Don't I guess. expect that <laughs> you're going to get the first weekend. But it's um, done. but yeah, I think they do get people who come. I mean, I you know I try to see every weekend of it because it, it's you know it's twelve plays you get to see essentially, and even though they may not be full length plays, they feel they're very satisfying. They're all very satisfying, um, and uh, I, I I love seeing it. I mean, I I think it's terrific, and to hear these young voices. So the the Charles Dickens thing. Yes, is that a. <laughs> Is that a time period thing? Because I know that you did the John Wilkes Booth show, too. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. are you a mid-late 1800s freak? Because <laughs> I am, so I'm asking. I was a seven-year-old that had a Civil War bedroom. I think I emailed you that once. Yes, yes, You probably yes. thought I was a crazed stalker. No, no. But from the time I came out of the womb, it was Lincoln, Lincoln, Lincoln. I mean, I was a weird little kid. that No Mickey Mouse, Lincoln. And my parents took me on a tour of... Uh, of Lincoln's life. We went to Kentucky and Illinois and then we went to Washington and I saw where he was shot and I saw where he died and it was all about Lincoln. When I, Lincoln was my imaginary friend when I was a kid and I had a Civil War bedroom and luckily it was the bicentennial so it was <laughs> so easy to have a Civil stuff. War bedroom. Right, and you could bring it back now with the 150th anniversary. See, when, that, when all that stuff comes back, my mom made me the curtains and everything out of these sheets she found that had, you know, guns and cannons and, and grays a Civil and... War flag and the blues and the grays. Uh-huh. So do you, when you said Dickens, then it hit me again because Victoria <laughs> Victorian England is kind of another time period that I'm 
Oh, yeah. Obsessed with constantly. And I love Charles Dickens is one of my all time favorite authors. And I'm a lit nut. Yeah. Um, so is that kind of that time period for you? Because you kind of look like you're from that time period. I would love to be from that time period in some ways. Maybe not. I, I, I would rather still have a toilet that worked. But yeah. um, And good medical care. And good medical care. Uh, yeah, I love that period. I, I'm, I'm kind of a history nerd in general, yeah, I, I think. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I, I love Victorian stuff. And. I love stuff from the 30s. And I was actually, we were talking about that after having seen, because two of the shows from the first weekend of the Young Playwrights Festival, one took place uh, in uh, an animation studio in the 50s, uh, and it was dealing with the ink and paint girls who painted the, the animation cells, and it kind of dealt with communism and the HUAC committee and things like that. Again, written by, I think, team. Wow. And then Gail's piece, which took place mostly in 1960s Russia. <laughs> and and I was wondering, you know, and that just amazed me to have two period pieces yeah. from from uh, teenagers. And, and I kind of looked back and I was like, well, I guess there was a period where I was obsessed with the Blitz in London and, you know, uh, just different historical periods I really got into and Dickens yeah. because of that as well, too. You know, I, I uh, saw Nicholas Nickleby, yeah. you know, that uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company production of that. And it's so transported you to that time and right. period that I, yeah I, I was obsessed with that yeah, and, it, and so it changes depending on what stories uh, I'm reading or hearing kind of what what uh, period of time I'm fascinated with but yeah I, I any other time than my own in some ways I feel like <laughs> <I would. laughs> any time at this. but isn't it interesting how certain periods of time and I think we don't really know why right. is it a deja vu thing is it just uh, a fascination is it a reincarnation thing but for some reason certain periods grab you and kind of resonate throughout your life well I think certainly you know look art is a great way into that and what Dickens did and what you know and Shakespeare as well yeah. you know when you get windows into these worlds that you have no way of seeing photographs or films of um uh they draw you in. All you have is the art, and that's, I think, also partly why we do what we do. Hopefully, in the future, it will be a window, you know, into this time for for people in the future. Maybe they'll think our hairdos were interesting and right, and, and want to live in this world. And somebody will say, "You really look like you could be from 2011." <laughs> exactly. I don't know what that means. I have ugly, distressed jeans on and a ripped right. up ACDC T-shirt. You look like you could be from 2011. Uh, but yeah, it's it's interesting because I watched The Runaways last night. Mm. And I was thinking, because, you know, growing up in the 70s and being alive in the 70s, yeah. but not being an adult, uh -huh. sometimes when I watch films that are set in the 70s, and that film definitely, it almost had like a grainy quality to it. They were really playing up the 70s. And I thought, oh, God, were the 70s were kind of, they were a little skeevy. Yeah. There was something just a little dirty and wrong about the 70s. <laughs> and I think as a kid, remember remembering that to an extent, but when you look back at it, it's almost like, did I really live through that time period? That's so interesting. I think sometimes that even 40 years away, sometimes you feel a little disconnected from an era you actually lived through. Yeah, I, I agree. But I think it's also where, I mean, like you have nostalgia for any you know period you grew up in, yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's true. But, but that period especially seemed so much more carefree because of that skeeviness, I think. Because yeah. obviously we didn't care what we looked like or we would have gotten haircuts. You know, yeah, and the the clothes. But I remember even as clothes. a kid thinking, yeah, these clothes are really terrible. Oh yeah, and you would just like get in a car with strangers, or you know, girls were hitchhiking up and down the street. You drive down the street, there'd be ten girls hitchhiking in hot pants. We did, and it we was, and we and most of us survived. Yeah, so, you know, we without all the you know restrictions and things we have now. So. There must, we must have been doing something right. I don't know quite what it was. Yeah, I, I, maybe just, you know, my mom says God takes care of drunks and fools. <laughs> maybe it was the latter of that. Because I remember even when we moved to Maryland for a few years to Baltimore that like inner tubing in the river, which I don't even know how safe that is wow. to begin with, and water moccasins just coming up on both sides <laughs> of the inner tubes and asking the kids, you know, what are those? Oh, it's dangerous, poisonous water moccasins. <laughs> and thinking, oh, well, that's probably not a good idea that I'm here. But OK, and then they would just swim off. I never got eaten by a water moccasin. No. Nope. But, you know, now you wouldn't even let your kids in the river for fear no. they would get bacteria or, I mean, we would put, you know, firecrackers in Coke cans and shoot. Why am I still, I still have fingers even? <laughs> exactly. But so, you know, I think that sometimes we, you have kind of an almost, gosh, did I even live through that? Right. It's hard to believe. And and, and someone also probably would have put up signs saying, warning, there are mo water moccasins in this water. You, right. You know, enter at your own risk. If right. You, you no know. one under 21 can get in the river in Ex inner tube. Exactly. So, you know, I think the fear of lawsuits, I think the more litigious we've gotten as a society right. too is kind of 
narrowed that carefree attitude. And then you look at the Civil War era, and you think, how did anybody survive an amputation or a, a bullet <laughs> extraction? Yet yeah. tens of thousands of guys did. Absolutely, and it's it's interesting. My bro- my brother's actually off uh, serving in Germany now. He's a, a liver and kidney transplant surgeon, and he had joined the wow. uh, joined the reserves uh, in the Navy a few years ago, and uh, got called up because they're you know 10 years over in afghanistan we're kind of running out of people <laughs> people are grown tired yeah so um so he's been in germany uh stitching up you know people coming out of afghanistan and stuff and you know it's kind of the other side of that where people are living now where in the past they, i mean with some of the, the things he's seeing and the injuries that he's he's uh sewing up you know in the past these people wouldn't have survived and we're going to have a very challenging time ahead with a lot of you know amputated and otherwise uh uh, soldiers coming back who we haven't seen on this level, you know, that uh, and these many numbers of injured soldiers coming back. It's going to be a very difficult and challenging time, I think. Yeah, not um, since Vietnam. I think if we had that many injured oh, soldiers and coming, even home. more so. And I think even you know with the advancements in med, you know, in in medicine, I I don't think we even then had that many. You know, and Vietnam was not. Ten years. I mean, I, I just don't. It's, yeah. Anyway, it's a, that's a whole. Well, we also, story, we but. didn't have the satellite technology. So if you were right. out in the jungle and a mine blew up, you would just lay there and die. Right. But exactly. Now we pretty much know where our soldiers exactly. are all the time. Someone gets hurt, you send get in help, and you get them out. Right. It's a whole different thing. It's not yep. that whole. I mean, some of those guys from World War II that kind of crawled off of the beach at oh. Normandy with one limb left. Yep. Nobody knew where they were until they found help. Yep. yep. So it's amazing that uh, that now that everything's so tracked. You know, I can see my dad's car from space on Google Earth. <laughs> right. So, you know, you, you pretty much, you, it's easy to get to people quickly and then quickly fly them to some place where your brother can sew them up with Absolutely. good technology. With good technology and, and, and help them to live. And, you know, and again, like the challenges of their life that they're going to have. And again, with new, you know, uh, prosthetics and things like that to right. get them walking hopefully again. But, yeah, it's it's going to be... Uh, going to be a challenge for this country i think it's amazing so yeah. real quick again your yes. show the times and how people can get tickets all right the show i have my I wrote, what is your play I wrote called notes. it's called a walk to the vet oh it's awesome see and uh it's going to be june 16th to the 19th as part of the young playwrights festival the 19th young Playwrights Festival at the stella adler theater which is at hollywood and highland and you can get tickets at the blank.com or you can call 323 323- Six six one nine eight two seven. Wonderful, Scott yeah. Lowell. Everybody, go and see him live on stage, sure. so you can see. And I have not seen you live on stage. Oh, this will be the come. first time. Oh well, good. You're I'm very come. excited. I'm going to come and see you because oh, I am. I have not seen you live yet. It is an experience, and I get to see you play. You, you know, a dog. a dog. And maybe I would want to adopt you afterwards. You might. There might be adoptions. Going is there going to be an adoption for you there afterwards? Might be. Maybe it depends. A raffle. How, it depends how cold and wet my nose is. <laughs> it's the Sheena Metal Experience, LA Talk Radio, and Scott. Will you come and see me again? I would love that. Oh, of course, I will, Sheena. And, thank you. And how can people find you online? Where's the best place? They can find me at scottlowell.com, or you can look me up on Facebook. I'm there as well. Or Wonderful. Twitter. Everywhere. And Twitter. Everywhere. You do it all. Yes. It's the Sheena Metal Experience, LA Talk Radio. If you missed any of the links for how to get a Scott Lowell and you didn't get that, uh, you can get to him through emailing me at SheenaMetalExperience.com or LATalkRadio.com, and I will gladly forward those links over to you. I'm Sheena. This is your experience. It's LA Talk Radio. Quick break, and we're right back with you with much more radio fun.